Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's special webinar. I'm Terry Ryder, founder of hotspotting.com.au, and today I'm speaking to the multi award winning buyer's agent and best selling author, Miriam Sankula. We're going to be talking about how to invest for long term success. But first, you have to cut through all the confusion, all that media white noise describing economic disruption, political meddling, general negativity, and all that inconsistent and sometimes contradictory data at market performance. It's not pe people's confidence to a certain degree and made many people hesitant. So these are times when we need to ignore all of that and start listening to genuine experts, people with experience and expertise and track record with residential property. And today we have such a person with us, Miriam Sankor of Property Mavens. Miriam, welcome. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much. And what a great um, lead into it, particularly the political interference and bickering and all of that. There's so much of that going on. It's hard to um, it's hard to get away from it. We, we could do a two-hour webinar on just that subject. I mean, it, it's, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Um, being a, a property professional and in the background, we've got this constant uh, meddling by politicians who don't understand how property markets work and certainly don't understand that every decision they make seems to make affordability worse or the, the rental shortage worse. Yeah, and I think this position of always taking a stick rather than a carrot, I mean, the costs of holding property across the nation have just gone through the roof in the last 12 months, particularly, you know, interest rates have gone up significantly, land tax has gone up, council rates have gone up, um, insurances have gone up significantly. And for landlords to want to apportion a small amount of that to a tenant is absolutely not unreasonable. And I was fortunate yesterday, I had a four minute interview on ABC Breakfast News because I actually messaged them saying, you just, you, you know, your, your media is just so one sided. You need someone talking about landlords and what they're bringing to the table. Um, and, and understand yeah. that the average landlord is not a, a wealthy person with 15 or 20 properties. The typical right. landlord has just one, maybe two properties. Correct. Ordinary people on average incomes and right. they're grappling with all these rising costs and to tell them that they, they can't increase the price of their product is just totally unreasonable. And you don't get governments interfering with banks when they, you know, deliver $10 billion profits saying you've made too much money and, you know, you're gonna, we're going to cap your earnings. Um, and, you know, you still have to work with the costs that you've got running your business, but we don't want you to earn any more because it's not fair to all these other people, apparently. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, real estate, um, rental real estate has been singled out as the only product in, or service in society where yeah. politicians are talk about restricting their ability to um, set their price according to their costs or to supply and demand issues. Yeah, they've absolutely politicised it. They're absolutely out there trying to buy votes. But, you know, ironically, you know, 70% of all landlords only own one property, 20% own two, and then only one, less than 1% own more than five properties. And then of those landlords, 40% of landlords earn $50,000 or less per annum. And they're usually over the age of 55. So if governments think they can buy votes from younger people or whoever it is that can't get into property, well, have a look at all these older people who basically tried to create their own funding into retirement that they're now saying, well, we're not going to let you feed yourself because, you know, you're a greedy landlord and we're going to dictate what you can and can't earn. But look, best we don't <laughs> keep going on about that. or, or keep going we, on. Risk, we, we do risk getting sidetracked. Um, that's <laughs> some of the, the background uh, against um, all that white noise in the background, there are some wonderful opportunities out there. I, I started this year saying 2023 is the year of opportunity for property investors. I haven't changed my view. I think you would probably tend to agree with that. There are wonderful opportunities. I'm going to talk about some of the ways that people can, can seize those opportunities for long-term gain. Yeah, and look, ironically, with vacancy rates being so low, that's why property is still a good investment because the potential for yields are, are strong and, you know, they're able to continue to grow over time because fundamentally we have a lack of supply. Absolutely. So, Miriam, you've got a, a presentation for us today. Absolutely. I'll just share that with everyone. So if you can just confirm that you can see my screen, that would be great. Yes, I can. Excellent. All right. So as you said, we're going to talk about the cut through and the confusion. We're going to invest for long-term success. 
As usual, um, I've got a disclaimer letting everybody know that um, I'm not providing tailored financial tax legal or property advice and recommend that everyone seeks their own independent accounting, legal finance and property advice from an expert before they embark on and action any information disclosed in this presentation. So as always, talk to experts, get your own advice relevant to your own situation. So who are we? Well, we are a multi-award winning uh, property advocacy agency. We do vendor and buyer advocacy. So we work with home buyers, sellers and investors. We provide independent and unbiased advice. And we work with separating couples, deceased estates, downsizers, upgraders, relocators, first home buyers, investors and self-managed super fund investors. Um, I mentioned multi-award winning, really thrilled to recently have my colleague, Anjay, who's our Aubrey Wodonga Sydney advocate. He won the Australian uh, Award, the winner for excellence in customer service, which was amazing this year for New South Wales. And I um, got pipped at the post and came in behind him in Victoria. And then as you can see, there are multiple awards uh, that we've been acknowledged for, including um, Buyers Agent of the Year, um, Innovator of the Year, Thought Leader of the Year, Property Entrepreneur of the Year, certainly Buyers Agent of the Year, having won that uh, and being nominated uh, locally for the state and nationally as well. So a little bit about me, for those who don't know me, the business has been operating for 10, just over 10 years now, 13 years. I've been in the industry for 27 years and whilst um, people might screw their nose up at age, <laughs> certainly nothing can beat experience. And, you know, with experience comes insight and with insight comes strategic advice. So there's a massive advantage of dealing with people who have got longevity in the sector. Um, I'm an accredited property investment advisor. I'm a best-selling author. I'm a significant real estate media commentator. And unfortunately, recently I've been um, called upon more and more to be an expert witness against other buyer agents who are coming into the sector with no industry experience. They've not served an apprenticeship. I call them fake buyer agents and they're starting to get sued, um, which is unfortunate for the clients that they actually work for. So we have a team, we're growing nationally. We're able to help clients um, throughout Victoria and New South Wales and soon other states. And what we're going to be talking about today is the multi-speed of property market that we've been experience, experiencing uh, property prices in 2024, certainly the investment opportunities available. Uh, we've got time for questions and there are some free resources available to everybody on the call as well. So let's talk about what's happening. And certainly um, this is definitely relevant to Melbourne, but also showing up um, a little bit nationally as well. So what we're seeing is outer suburbs are struggling, whereas the affluent markets are securing growth and they tend to be inner and closer to the centre of the CBD and that kind of amenity. Um, we have seen record prices still being paid at auction. Just this weekend, I bought a property for a client and it more or less set a, a new benchmark in the suburb, which was unfortunate, but it was two home buyers and it was very heated competition. And we have very low stock levels. Um, so we're seeing some increased at mortgage arrears. We've got vacancies around Australia that are the lowest that they've ever been recorded. We know that we've got councils cracking down on Airbnbs, and I'll talk about that later. But we also have more cashed up buyers. So we've got older buyers in a strong financial position, thanks to property um, thanks to property rises of recent years. And they've either got low or no mortgages and they're looking to buy real estate and they have the means and the inclination to find what they're looking for. On the other side of that, there are typically younger buyers, buyers seeing rate rises and that's crimping the amount that they can borrow. And they're actually now competing for properties that are 15 to 20% more expensive than they were three years ago. But we're also seeing some... Um, property owners selling under duress they're not able to cope with um, the mortgage um, mortgages coming out of fixed rates and some of them are actually selling for less than what they paid two, two to three years ago and of course that all depends on what you bought where you bought it and what attributes the property has and of course supply and demand of that property type. So we do expect demand of rentals to continue to rise, particularly with immigration, and we know they're opening the doors to hundreds of thousands of people to come in, which will only make our um, rental crisis worse, which is quite sad, but therein lies the opportunity for investors. We know rents and yields are rising and there's good compensation to offset interest rates. Um, and we do know in Victoria that listings are down again, um, and that's due to vendor and market sentiment. So if we look at 
dwelling approvals, and this is Sydney uh, and Melbourne, and this is July 22 to February 23. We can see that more people are wanting to live closer to town, but most new homes are sort of being skewed to the outer suburbs. So, to, you know, if you're looking at the 25 kilometre and out mark, um, there's a significant amount of properties that are being built in those areas. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting that supply and demand, um, people want to live closer, but the available land is further out. And certainly governments and local councils are talking about wanting to do more high density development in those inner suburbs, because the cost of putting infrastructure out is significantly more expensive than putting infrastructure in the um, suburbs that are in the inner to middle rings. But then of course, you've got the attitude of people don't want it in their own backyard. So there's a lot to navigate there. Now, if we look at um, CoreLogic, we can see that there has been, um, oh, I think I've got a bit of double up going on, but there's been high amenity and tightly held um, properties that are, have been performing well in the inner to middle ring suburbs. You can find them right across you know, Adelaide, um, which has performed incredibly well in recent the recent year, inner Brisbane and Sydney from the eastern suburbs to better lo located areas in the western ring suburbs. And that's what's driving the current rebound. So in Melbourne, it's a loop swinging from Princess Hill through to Brunswick and then around through the eastern suburbs like Surrey Hills and um, Elstonwick. All right. So, as I mentioned, the urban fringes are struggling a little bit, and this is this two-speed market. So they're mostly low-density, sprawling estates dominated by detached family homes, um, and these areas enjoyed relatively good price movements in 2019 when interest rates were rock bottom and during that COVID period. But despite the broad market gains of the last few months, 27% of suburbs remain at at least 10% below their peak, according to CoreLogic. So you can see there's... Um, some significant differences in the states, and there's a difference between regional and capital cities and how they're performing as well. But basically, out of suburban and some regional areas are dominating that group where performance has changed significantly. And one thing I'll say about regional, the size of the regional area does actually make a difference in terms of how that area is performing. So certainly size of population, employment opportunities, um, buyer demand, tenant demand, so forth, infrastructure development. All right, so are the outer suburbs cooked? Well, certainly the brunt is going to be felt in those more affordable areas. I mentioned before that people have got crimped spending and more on, they're likely to be more unemployment in outer suburbs. But to counter that, there'll be higher immigration and that lack of affordability in those inner suburbs may in fact drive home buyers out to those areas. Um, we've had 850,000 homeowners coming off those low mortgage rates. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to um, screamingly be suffering as a result of that, but there will be some pressure that's going to be put on in those areas. If we talk about the regional areas, again, that two-speed market, so where provincial centres were the darling in 2022, particularly New South Wales, the party is now over but major centres will stabilise and hold. And again, I mean centres with 80,000 people or more, um, employment opportunities, infrastructure development, good amounts of amenity to serve the population as it grows and so forth. And of course, there's still that issue of lack of, lack of affordability. So there's still growth in regional centres. There are still people now, because interest rates are where they're at and first home buyers are trying to get into the market, a lot of them are still seeing large regional centres as an option for them to go to. And also people who are living in the city, they might be in a very small property or an apartment, but it's particularly New South Wales and Sydney, but it's worth an enormous amount of money. Um, and those people with families are selling up and going to regional centres where they can just have wonderful lifestyles, big homes, um, still in a Sydney wage, but live a better quality life. So in terms of factoring um, that in, we are seeing a continued decline in those smaller towns, but the major centres will stabilise, and that's places like Albury, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo. Um, and... If you are looking to buy, you do need to factor in that two-speed market regardless of where you're considering buying. Um, so 
it is an indication of where the market might be heading. So you have to be careful of, again, location, property type and so forth. You do want to get professional advice. Gut feeling simply won't work in this market. Um, and those properties that aren't investment grade will underperform in years to come. So whilst, you know, all boats float in a rising tide, um, certainly if you've bought poorly in recent years, and I know, um, you know, a lot of people have done this boardless buying and, and bought incredibly cheaply and think they've, you know, done incredibly well because they've got a massive hike um, in recent years. Now is the time that they're likely to see significant decline. Um, and as I mentioned before, for a lot of people, if they haven't bought well, the party's over. All right, so where are prices heading? Well, the bigger capital cities are recording pretty solid growth. Um, led by Sydney and Brisbane, and Perth and Adelaide have delivered gains over the past year as well. Melbourne is emerging from the dol doldrums. Um, Terry, we were having a little chat before. What are you seeing in terms of your reporting and, and research? Well, one of the things that we do every quarter, Miriam, is, is have a look at what's happening with the sales activity trends. Uh, we find that significant, often a, a forward indicator of what might happen with prices. And in the latest quarter, we've just finished the analysis for the latest quarter. And what really stands out is just how strongly Melbourne has recovered after perhaps 12 months or more of trending downwards um, and being a struggling market in the most recent quarter, it's come back very strongly in terms of activity. Um, the, some, some of the strongest sectors are the, the inner city areas. Um, the city of Melbourne itself, um, I think we're going to talk more about this a little bit later in the presentation, but certainly demand for apartments in, in good inner city areas is strong. We've all seen, also seen evidence of that recovery in, in regional Victoria, but as you mentioned earlier, it's very much being led by the, the larger centres, the larger cities, uh, Geelong, Ballarat and Bendigo are the big three, um, and so, some of the others as well that um, have strong economies are doing quite well. But um, recovery is the theme, and it's, it's quite a strong one. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, the smaller capitals like Hobart, Darwin and Canberra are floundering a little bit. Um, regional centres have performed strongly, as we spoke about of late, uh, but South Australia and Queensland, um, only South Australia and Queensland have had the, the strongest results. And I, I think initially at the beginning of this year, you know, commentators thought it was all going to be um, quite gloomy, but they were caught off guard by burst of price growth in and around March. So that optimism spread from Sydney to other centres um, and until the la RBA's last two rate rises sort of slowed down momentum a little bit. And of course, that's a comes into play as well. But like I said, um, we need to review some of the factors we know will play a role and make some judgments about how they'll play up. So there's a you know variable number one is the so-called mortgage cliff. Um, where borrowers will be shunted from low fixed rates to about 2% um, that they've been enjoying <laughs> to current variable rates between 5.6 and 6.2%. It's been underway for some time now. We haven't seen a major market impact. Um, but again, those areas that are prone to the mortgage cliff tend to be in the outer fringes of our capital cities um, and larger regional centres like Ipswich in Queensland. And look, I don't expect a tidal wave of defaults. I mean, I think most people will do whatever they can to try and hang on to their property and they'll refinance and, and you know, be pragmatic around it where they can. And mortgage brokers are great at giving them solutions on those kind of issues. And banks have been proactive about it as well, where they've been reaching out to their customers and clients before they've coming off these interest rates to see what they can do to help them um, transition and if they've had to put, um, you know, payment freezes in place and so forth. Um, We're in the profit reporting season as well, Miriam, and the big banks are, are, are reporting that the transition of people from fixed rates to variable rates has ha happened in a, a fairly orderly fashion. They're not seeing a great attrition rate as yet. Um, their um, delinquency rates that people are behind on their mortgage hasn't um, lifted significantly. I think the idea of a cliff is very much a media creation. I mean, it's, it's definitely true that a large number of people are coming off fixed rates mortgages, but the idea of things falling off a cliff, something that media loves to generate yeah. um, as clickbait headlines, but the reality usually, and in this case, it's been borne out again, uh, the reality is far less dramatic. 
Yeah, so no tidal wave of defaults, but, you know, the pressure in areas with higher debt loads and um, owners with lower equity, they'll, uh, they'll definitely feel it. Okay, so um, we've got some interesting factors this year with the surge of people buying homes for cash without a mortgage, which is quite surprising. If you look at those stats, it's really surprising. Um, according to the reports by PEXA, the property transaction agency, a quarter of all buyers on the eastern seaboard settled with cash. And a lot of them were in country areas, several suburbs in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast are also prominent. But the strong cash purchase rates amount around central Sydney and Melbourne, along with heavy cash buying of vacant land in outer suburbs, suggests a return of overseas investors. Um, but it's also the cashed up baby boomers who've been driving most of the growth, particularly in places like Maryborough, Taree, Broadbeach, Frankston, Kellyville. Um, and it just serves that uh, as a reminder that anyone who's purchasing with a 10% deposit uh, is less likely to potentially be able to get, you know, the property that they're looking for. Uh, and they need to understand where the market goes next and track buyers with significant resources as an indicator. I think that's a very significant factor, Marima, in explaining why... Um... Prices haven't fallen this year, despite the interest rate rises. It's confounded the economists who all forecast 15, 20% price decline this year because of rising interest rates. Mm. Uh, there are many reasons why that hasn't happened, but one of the reasons is so many cash buyers out there aren't completely unaffected by mm. uh, interest rates. And um, many of them are downsizers that have sold their home and yeah. bought it. Yeah, I was just about to say, certainly if you have a look here in Sydney, you know, 51% with a median selling price of 1.45 million of paying cash, and they're very much a downsizers. Um, similarly in Melbourne, albeit the median's a lot lower. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, their homes that they've held for 20, 30, 40 years, they've benefited from significant capital growth over that time. And for a lot of them, it has proven to be their superannuation plan. You know, they're selling up, they're downsizing in terms of a smaller property, they're able to put money into super, um, it's 300000 per individual. So if they're a couple, they have the ability to tip in at least up to 600000 from their principal place of residence if they've held on to it for more than 10 years. Um, and they're taking advantage of that. So on the one hand, it's good because it's going to draw um, less uh, demand from something like the pension. So they're becoming self-funded. But, yeah, it's evident that a lot of that, as well as the cashed-up buyers and foreign investors, is what's driving that too. And it's always sad because it makes it really difficult for people who are borrowing and trying to get their foot in the market. But that's where it's important to work with an expert who, you know, can take you from wish list to reality and give you guidance and direction around what you need to do and what you need to consider to end up where you want to be. And they're tough conversations. They're not easy conversations. So you need an advisor to have the emotional intelligence and experience and empathy to be able to have those conversations with you um, because they're not easy. And it's very challenging for people to deal with the difference between the two. Okay, so um, the total value of new housing loans remains very high. So after a year of rate rises every month, the RBAs lifted rates, um, the rises have had a big impact on the number of home loans approved, typically a reliable sign of how prices are likely to travel over the next six to 12 months. But it's interesting to note that the value of mortgages has only retreated to the same level as it was in 2019. Uh, and while the speed of that decline has been rapid, it has now stopped and could be the start um, of a trend upwards. So I'm going to say <laughs> the rent juggernaut continues unabated and I expect rental growth to hit double digits in 2024. So that's a quote from an article I wrote recently. Um, so, you know, right. go ahead. So, so, oh, I think you're absolutely right, Miriam. So some, some commentators are forecasting that the, the, the period of the high rental rate rises is, um, is over. Um, I, I don't see that happening at all. I think we've still got tremendous upward pressure on rentals. Oh, absolutely, particularly if we've got 400,000 immigrants coming in. I mean, where's everyone going to live, basically? And you've got to remember during COVID, a lot of people were sharing apartments and, you know, share accommodation. And then after COVID, everyone went, oh, I've had enough of that, I want my own place. And that absorbed a lot of stock as well. So we've had 
some really unusual black swan events leading into where we are now that's impacted um, the availability of rental property and the market's still prime for significant rental growth. Um, you know, and the Albanese the government's, federal government's sorry, sorry. The Albanese government's plan to build 30,000 social housing units won't have any impact whatsoever on the market and it's absolutely nowhere near where it needs to be. And I think all governments at state and federal levels have been negligent for decades because they haven't taken the issue of social housing seriously because they've absolutely relied on landlords to do that. And of course, um, when it's convenient to try and buy votes, they come out with a stick. You know, will rent freezers work at the end of the day? Well, they'll be counterproductive totally. They'll make the situation considerably worse. But And also the, the federal government's proposed solution to the shortage crisis, building $1.2 million new homes. There's no way that they can build that no, many homes in five years. We don't have the capacities to do it. We don't um, have the trades. We don't have, we, yeah. I mean, they're just statements that sound good, unfortunately, but there's no real foundation underneath it and no track record to support it. And no real intention either. I think in Australia, we, we never fix problems. We we hold press conferences, we have inquiries, we have royal commissions, um, but we never actually produce solutions, real solutions to the problems that exist. And housing affordability and the rental shortage is just another example of that. Yeah. Look, the Rudd government pursued a similar housing initiative in 2009 and they delivered 20,000 units, but it did literally nothing to alter rents or housing affordability. You know, there is the NRAS scheme, um, the National Rental Affordability Scheme, that did operate for a little while and there was a requirement of developers to include affordable housing within, um, within new developments and there's capacity for that to continue. I don't know why they've let that go, but that's certainly one way in new bills to ensure that there's affordable um, housing being built and provided within every new um, development, particularly high rises and larger developments as well. The problem is politicians cannot resist the temptation to treat the housing industry as a cash cow. All three levels of government do it. They keep milking it for revenue. They can't resist that ongoing temptation. Um, and right now, when we need them to be doing the opposite to encourage the creation of new dwellings, particularly affordable ones, and also to encourage investors to get into the market and buy rental properties and make them available, they're... Um, yeah, the, the following the stick approach, as you said, rather than the carrot. And, mm, um, exactly. Um, yeah, so we're not getting outcomes. Yeah, exactly. And look, I guess for landlords, you know, the key period to watch is February and March when um, most centres, 30% of leases roll over. Uh, so there'll be the months that we want to pay attention and see how big those rate rises will be. But in short, this is <laughs> this is what's going on in the market. You know, it's um, it's quite strange. Um, and overall, the numbers might not look great, but below the surface, the dynamics will be really interesting. You know, we've had growth spurts kicked off with family homes in Sydney. Middle Ring was driven through winter by areas like Melbourne's prestigious Brayside. Um, you know, in 2024, I expect most of the high performing areas to be in the inner and middle ring suburbs of capital cities and in the larger suburbs, um, the larger cap regional areas like Newcastle and Geelong and Ballarat. Um, but yeah, rent rises play a much bigger role in 2024 than we're accustomed to. Uh, and this is a good reason why it is uh, an opportunity to attract investors and, and encourage some renters to try and buy into more affordable sectors of the market. But, you know, the overall market will produce um, lukewarm results, but rewarding returns for shrewd investors. So, yeah, let's have a look at the rental supply trends and the implications. So, as we mentioned, we've got the lowest vacancy rates in decades. We've got a severe undersupply of property that won't be resolved in the short term, regardless of government announcements. Certainly, Melbourne listings are down year on year in Melbourne, 28%. Um, you know, there are low stock levels. So if you are buying in the market, you need to be responsive when an opportunity presents itself. That mortgage cliff, as we said, is a slow burn. Um, stock levels are increasing, but are they the right areas to be investing in? I'm going to talk a little bit more about council crackdowns with um, Airbnbs and state government, but make sure that if you are looking to buy, that you're still looking to buy something that's got great potential for capital growth and cash flow. 
So, oops, sorry, Terry, I didn't realise that was there the whole time. No one told me. Uh, that's, right. that's all right. So, look, like I said before, consider multiple growth drivers, assess every property on individual merit, consider the uh, property type. So before you're actually looking at buying, you know, are you buying an apartment, a house or a townhouse? Um, bear in mind there are minimum rental standards uh, across the states and some states are looking to increase them, but that's where they're at at the moment. We know the A-grade properties are that top 5 8% of the market and they're, there are less of them, but they perform better. And also be aware of cultural appeal. I've had clients who are more than happy to buy with close proximity to a rail line because it doesn't bother them, but certainly from an investment uh, capital growth point of view and a resale point of view, that is detrimental. So it's really important to um, take those into consideration and make sure you're not factoring them in when you're investing. And also look for infrastructure development. So you can see with Victoria's big bill, there's so much going on there. Um, obviously, there were promises of things <laughs> uh, in addition to that that may not be coming to the fore. But anywhere you go in Melbourne at the moment, you know, if you're crossing freeways or driving around in the suburbs, you've got the um, you've got the level crossings just con remove removal continuing to happen. Um, you've got the Westgate tunnel tunnel project continuing. Every time you sort of cross the bridge, you have to try and figure out what direction you're going in because things seem to change but look it's good news at the end of the day it'll ultimately be fantastic for Victoria and Victoria's got the most infrastructure spend going on in the whole country so it's a really good sign from an investment point of view. So let's talk about what to buy and I'll start with regional. So you really want livable units and you want to, or houses and you want to think of your target market tenant and I'm going to say the dirty word or potentially an Airbnb guest. So there are 380,000, 386,000 properties registered on Airbnb. Now, to be fair, some of them are only offering a room for rent. Others are offering the whole property. But we saw during COVID and after, uh, particularly during COVID when no one was allowed to travel overseas, there was massive demand for people to travel interstate. Obviously, the hotels didn't have enough accommodation. People saw that Airbnb was a fantastic opportunity to rent a property out on a nightly basis and make potentially significantly more money. And that's contributed to why a lot of people have taken their properties out of the residential um, long-term market and put it into the um, short-stay market. So if you are thinking of investing, it doesn't hurt to keep in the back of your mind, could this property potentially suit for an Airbnb? Um, regionally, you want to be looking at three to four bedroom houses or two to three bed villa units, depending on your budget. Of course, you want good amenity and open living floor plan. You want good build quality, good installation. Um, areas where there's high owner occupiers and tightly held is a good um, concept to work with. You must have some sort of outdoor space. If you're buying in a villa, you don't want more than 10 within the group. Of course, there's got to be car parking and some sort of storage on the property as well. Um, look for high performing suburbs that you might be able to get in and buy a two bedroom villa in if you can't afford a house. Like anything, you want close to public transport and local amenity, and you want to think of resale capital growth and income. So this little property on the bottom here, my colleague Anjay, who's in Albury Wodonga, uh, this is actually a unit that he bought for his client in December 2020. He was able to buy uh, 30000 under the vendor's asking price for 420000 Actually, apologies, it was a house um, back then. And the current valuation um, two and a half years later is 630,000. So the clients had 50% capital growth in two and a half years and they're getting a 5.6% yield on it. So definitely the regional areas, um, you still wanna take them into consideration, but you wanna deal with someone who knows uh, those areas intimately. Then if we go back and look at Metro, again, depending on your budget, um, this is what we were talking about just before, Terry. You mentioned apartments because they're in very high demand. They're in very low supply. They are sought after by downsizers, um, but they're also sought after by Airbnb investors as well. Um, this little one here is a two-bedroom apartment I just bought recently uh, for a client in Carlton. Within the first week, they had 50 groups of people through. Um, and no one could put offers in because the contract wasn't ready. Uh, then the contract came about, and then interestingly enough, there were issues with combustible cladding, but we, and that scared pretty well everyone off, we did a whole lot of due diligence around it, including talking to the owners' corporation and getting extra information, 
and um, my client made a calculated decision understanding the risks and implications that he wanted to go ahead because this ticked every box from their own personal use point of view and Airbnb perspective um, and we went ahead and bought it so you know that's this was definitely at least 55 square meters again if it's a villa unit you want to take that into account you want a good amenity open floor plan good aspect good build quality one of the issues you will come up against with apartments particularly those built in the last 20 years is that a lot of them do have combustible cladding issues but if you're patient and willing to do the research to understand what the issue actually is and the cost of it potentially um, then there still may be really good opportunities for you um, you want to buy in low rise and smaller complexes where you can. I mean, you can see this is a low rise here. Again, you always want car space and storage on title, those inner and middle suburbs in and around the CBD uh, are in high demand and, of course, close to public transport. Um, you want established properties. Sorry, Terry, you were about to say something. I was just going to ask you a question. Um, yeah. when, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very strongly advocating apartments in good locations in our biggest cities has um, there's been a paradigm shift I think in terms of their viability for investors but there's always a pushback from people that have this concept in their heads that because of the lack of land content you're not going to get the capital growth so what's your response to people who have that objection to to buying apartments Look, I understand that, but recent data, you didn't get the capital growth when we had low demand and a massive supply. I mean, I remember I, where I could look at um, Port Melbourne a number of years ago and there were 25 pages of apartments for sale. You know, now I can go onto realestate.com and look for apartments for sale and there might only be two or three pages. So everything boils down to supply and demand and there is data to um, quantify that people have earned good capital growth on apartments that's keeping up with um, houses, for want of a better word, because, again, high demand, low supply, uh, affordable entry point, appeal to first home buyers and investors. And if you buy well, if you buy an A-grade property, you've got the capacity to potentially do incredibly well. So you're, we've always got to be careful about generalisations. You know, apartments are great providing you buy the right one with the right attributes for the right price and the right location with the right amenity. Um, but you do need to avoid particular types of um, properties, which are your cookie cutter apartments, you know, your apartments that have just been, been built in the city with three or 400 of them in there. Um, I'd be petrified if there was a fire at the bottom and you had to get out of the top, uh, to get down from the top pretty quickly. So there are rules around what to buy, what to not buy, and then they need to be applied. But absolutely, I've got an example coming up, I think, um, of, of a client who's done significantly well out of an apartment and there are reasons for that. So you want to make sure you're buying prudently, get you know um, help if you need it, don't compromise on livability standards, look for property in and around Melbourne around that 600 to 820,000 range. Um, and if you buy well, you can expect capital growth from uh, the property itself as well as income because we know rental yields are strong. Um, yeah, so definitely buying those flats or buying those apartments in boutique small buildings um, are in high demand. And this one in particular did not have a swimming pool, it did not have a gymnasium, it did not have ridiculously high owner's court fees, and that was part of the appeal as well. What was the location of this one? Alton. Okay. Yeah, just across oh. just across Nicholson Street um, over to Brunswick. So it was literally walking distance to Brunswick Street and all the lifestyle there as well. And it was a very wide tree-lined street, so very quiet street. Yeah, nicely located for universities and hospitals as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I said, why? Well, you know, there was a boom of cookie-cutter apartments. Those livable units are now in short supply. And I've mentioned about, you know, rising demand, first home buyers, downsizers, um, you know, and we need to expect that the gap between demand and what the industry is building will continue to widen. The industry is seeing that people want to downsize into apartments that are large to replace their three or four bedroom home. So there are um, developers building to local owner occupiers who want a three bedroom apartment or a three bedroom and a study they want to um, have sufficient parking. They want storage. Some of them now have got, uh, you know, your communal areas with tool sheds in them and all that kind of stuff. That is very much for the owner-occupier market. Um, but you do want to factor in from an investment point of view 
if you're getting either a permanent tenant in there or you're going to Airbnb it, what does it have that would appeal to that person in that situation to get them to rent your property versus somebody else's? Um, and we do have people, you know, who left it co during COVID, they've had enough of the sunshine. <laughs> They're coming back to Melbourne for the lifestyle, not the weather. I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> um, but that's happening too. And we also know the potential with um, Airbnbs is to earn a high yield. Uh, and Terry, this article we were both recently quoted in, uh, and we were talking, I think you were mentioning outer ring municipalities like Melton, Casey, and Casey Frankston, Whittlesea and Wyndham were good in terms of low vacancy rates um, and in strong demand as well. Do you recollect what else you quoted in that article at the time? People can download it off my website if they like under the media tab. But you um, were talking about recovering suburbs. So Maidstone, Canley, Dubton, Endeavour Hills, Cranbourne East, Frankston South. Yeah, that's very much the trend that we have determined in our latest analysis of the quarterly sales activity figures. The number of locations that we previously had classified as declining markets because of the downward trend in activity have become what we call recovering markets. There's been a sharp upturn in the most recent quarter. And some that previously we had classified as recovering markets have continued that uplift. So now we call them rising markets. But you know, recovery is the theme, absolutely, um, right across Melbourne. Um, but where we've seen it strongest, where we've seen demand strongest is actually those, um, the city of Melbourne itself, the city of Melbourne, a local government area, which includes um, the CBD, uh, West Melbourne, East Melbourne, uh, North, North Melbourne, um, Carlton, those sorts of places, um, the case study you just mentioned, uh, that kind of area, we're seeing tremendous uplift in demand for apartments, both for lifestyle reasons and affordability reasons. Oh. And I think it's I think it's a um, a very significant trend in the big cities of Australia, not just Melbourne. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the risk. One thing people need to understand, if you're going to look at a property for Airbnb, it is a very high risk strategy. And the reason is you're taking a residential property, you're now operating as an accommodation provider, and you're susceptible to all the risks that come with being an accommodation provider. So for example, as I mentioned before, if you're looking at the, the building itself, an apartment building, you need to consider combustible cladding. You want to look at the zoning, depending on the state that you're buying in, certainly in Western Australia, um, in some areas where you buy in some property types, they are zoned for short stay and everything else is residential. Now, there could be a point in time where governments go, right, anything that's residential can't be used for short stay accommodation. Um, that's it. End of story. So just maybe think about that. Uh, you need to factor in damage repairs, insurance claims. I talk to people all the time. I think everyone who's doing some sort of short stay at some point in time has some kind of problem. Everything from someone coming in and damaging furnishings, um, using stolen credit cards. So not only do you end up not getting paid because the credit card's stolen, you end up with damage, then you have to do an insurance claim. And depending on the cost of the damage and what your, um, what your sort of, I can't think of the word, I've gone blank, what your buffer is or what your excess is, uh, determines whether or not it's worth it. <clears throat> Obviously, you're vying for ratings when you're putting your property out, so you want people to score it well, but that's subject to the level of management, <clears throat> the quality of the cleaning and the costs associated with running that. I know people who've done short stay and they live in Doncaster and they drive out to Rye and they spend three hours cleaning the property and then they drive back again and they had to do that because they could not find any locals that delivered a standard that would keep their rating where it's at. So please don't think it's easy or get someone else to do it. You have to think if it turns to muck and there are no cleaners or they're not good enough, can I and will I and am I prepared to go and do the grunt work myself? Because you may need to. Uh, then, of course, factor in potential vacancies. And we're also talking about caps of rental nights. So we now know that New South Wales, um, I think in the inner city, has put in a cap of no more than 180 nights throughout a 12-month period can be used for short stay. Uh, Victoria, they're starting to talk about the possibility of that. We had the Melbourne City Council talking about this morning that they're going to put it out to the public for feedback. Um, but these are often self-reporting requirements. So how they're going to police them, who knows? Um, a little bit like some of the <clears throat> regular, a lot of the regulations that are brought in with self-reporting. It doesn't necessarily mean it's effective. 
And look, if you do the numbers and crunch, crunch the numbers like I've indicated here, if you factor in your council rates, your registration fees that you might need to do with a local council if it's short stay, land tax, um, which is usually lower for apartments because there's less land associated with it, insurance, etc. Just work it out on a cost per night that you might earn over 180 nights. If you're earning 150 a night at 180 as a cap, you have the potential to earn 27 per annum. Well, how does that compare once you remove all of your costs um, or before you do that to maybe having a long-term permanent tenant? But the biggest issues with short stay are damage, repairs, insurance, cleaning, management. So um, please don't think it's easy peasy and there's not going to be any risk associated with it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so getting it right. I spoke before about if you're going to buy the right apartment, it needs to be, be boutique, it needs to be unique. This shows here this particular building uh, that was built in 1999 is heavily owner-occupied. It was by a, um, a well-known architect in Melbourne and it's had significant growth since 2003 up to March 21 when we bought it for our client. I've appraised that property recently. I was able to buy it off market, 120,000 under the vendor's asking price. And today it would be worth 1.85 to 1.995 million. So you can make money on apartments if you're selective and you buy that high performing stock. Um, I always say stay away from off the plan. This is how you can get it wrong. Um, you know, these people were sold the typical story, you know, <clears throat> that it's penthouse, you know, and they bought it for 1.56 million in 2020. We did a review of it two years later and we indicated that it had lost that in value significantly. And they also made the mistake of buying two in Sydney at the same time, which had also dropped in value significantly. So, you know, high performing properties bought in the same period appreciated around the 15% mark. Um, there's a reason you pay an expert to give you advice. It's not just to get you an outcome, but it's to ensure you're not going to make a mistake. And in this case, this person would be hundreds of thousands, million dollars at least better off if they had to pay for an expert rather than listen to a selling agent who told them that every property is fantastic and you can save stamp duty. Uh, and to be fair, for foreign investors, they are limited to only buying off the plan anyway, but you can be selective about what you buy. Uh, just an indication here, you know, the difference between a C-grade property and an A-grade property if you're spending 600000 Now, if you buy a, a C-grade property and you only average 3% per annum, you can see what it's worth in 10, 20, 30 years versus what it's worth if you buy an A-grade property that performs at a higher level. So there is a cost. People who don't uh, work with experts will pay a price. Usually it's in poor capital growth, and that's usually a lot more than if they work with someone in the first place. So in terms of how we can help people buying or selling, whether it's Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane or regional markets, as I said, we work with home buyers, upgraders, downsizers, investors. So if anyone's in that situation and they'd like to reach out, you're more than welcome to do so. And Terry, over to you for any questions. Okay, thanks, Miriam. Um, Rowena has made a comment about NDIs you touched on. Was that... That's something you um, had any particular information about um, as, as a scheme? I think you just referred to it as something that... Yeah, there's NRAS, which is a National Rental Affordability Scheme. Um, I've written a chapter about that in my book, my best-selling book, Property Prosperity. I think you can download it off Kindle for all of $5. That talks in detail about what it was, um, how it worked, the things you had to be wary of, because um, some of those NRAS properties have now come out of their lease agreements. Um, so whether or not it's still active or they're planning to bring it back in is yet to be seen. If you're talking about the disability uh, incentives or building homes for NDIS, that's a different thing altogether. Um, I'm not really in a position to talk at length about that. I don't have enough information about it. Yeah. Rowena has just corrected her, her question. She said, she said, yes, it was NRAS, not NDIS that she was referring to. Um, I think, think her comment was that um, she found that sometimes those properties were inflated in price because they, they had the NRAS thing happening. Yeah, and it's like anything. You're buying it off the plan or you're buying it with a concept and the limitations with some of those properties, and it's all in the head lease. It, there's a lot of complexity to it rather than boring everyone because they may not be interested but like I said download my book there's a whole chapter in it it talks about the pros and cons what to be wary of um, but certainly 
Sometimes those NRAS leases were attached to compromised property, what I call compromised property that from a resale point of view aren't particularly good. And I had someone come to me and ask me to help them buy or rather sell an NRAS property. And it was a terrible floor plan. It was tiny. Um, it wasn't anything I would ever have recommended they bought. And unfortunately, you know, they had to keep dropping the price to eventually sell it. So again, arm yourself with knowledge or get some expert help. Yeah, I'd like to touch on that point at a little bit greater length because I, I'm a firm believer in the importance for investors to invest in advice before they invest in real estate. And I find that 90% um, of investors try to penny pinch their way to success in property investment. I don't think it works that way. You've got to be willing to invest in good information and good advice to get the best result out of property investment. It's false economy to, to try and do it on the cheap. Yeah, and I guess I'd say you don't make money on what you know. You lose money on what you don't know. And when you don't know what you don't know, that's where you're vulnerable. And property is complex. There are so many things to consider and there are so many different property types. There are so many different locations. You know, it's so complex that work, you know, reading books and all that is great, but working with an expert is really an insurance policy against making a $600,000 million, $2 million, $3 million mistake. I mean, if you're going to insure your car from getting hit, why wouldn't you insure your hard-earned money that you've possibly got debt on to try and prevent making a mistake that could cost you a lot of money down the track that is always significantly more than getting an expert? Um, Terry, I know we've, we've sort of gone a little bit over time. Did you have any other questions you want to sort of look at? Or? Oh, we're okay for time. Um, we've, we've still got some questions coming in. Um, uh, David, for example, is asking about some uh, specific locations in regional Victoria. We talked about regional Victoria and the importance of getting location right, particularly targeting the the more substantial centres with the critical mass, the larger populations and the more diversity in their economies. David specifically referring to locations like Shepparton, Warrnambool and Mildura. Mm. Well, look, I yeah. still come back to fundamentally, what's the minimum population size of those areas? And Warrnambool does absolutely not have a population of 80,000 80, people plus. Um, so it's great that there are locations where they're doing that, but you need to take a long-term approach and you need to look at multiple growth drivers, population size and amenity being one of them, unless you're trying to time the market, get in, get out, which is a whole different strategy from long-term, you know, um, buy and hold capital growth. So understand if you're flipping, um, yeah, just understand what your strategy is and, and move forward subject to what your strategy is. But flipping is also high risk because you need to time a, pro time a market um, to get in at the right uh, end and to get out at the right end. And sometimes they talk about things that may be coming but aren't guaranteed to be coming, which if it doesn't happen, you've bought the wrong property in the wrong location without sufficient other attributes and growth drivers to support it. Okay. The Tony's asking, do you have a preference for any... Queensland regional centres, uh, small regional cities, other than Toowoomba and Harvey Bay. I'm not sure why other than Toowoomba and Harvey Bay. Do I've got some thoughts on that. Do you have any thoughts on no, that? No, I don't. Go for it, Terry. <laughs> Look, I, I think um, regional Queensland does have a lot of good options. Um, regional Queensland does offer growth from the population growth perspective. Um, some good, strong regional cities with um, some critical mass and diversity to their economies. Um, they offer affordability and high rental yields as well with a big infrastructure spend. Um, Toowoomba is one of those. Uh, Townsville in the north uh, is definitely um, a regional city with uh, critical mass and great diversity to its economy. Affordability, good rental yields. You just got to be aware that it's in that uh, tropical north zone where you're paying much higher insurance uh, costs than, than elsewhere. Uh, Rockhampton's another a city of strength. Gladstone, although a little bit too orientated towards the resources sector for some people, there are lots of options there uh, to be considered. Um, but I would certainly have Toowoomba at the top of my list at the moment. Um, someone was asking about, I see someone's talking about Perth. Um, 
Yeah, Perth's an interesting market. I actually served my apprenticeship as a buyer's advocate there many moons ago. I own property in Perth. Um, I know that for a lot of these so-called borderless buyer agents, they're all jumping on it because certain suburbs are cheap. And I also know that a lot of them don't know what they're doing and they outsource their role to third parties who've got no legal responsibility to the client. Uh, they're basically buying property sight unseen and they don't inspect them themselves, which is highly risky. And they're also buying into areas of suburbs that the locals won't touch. So the selling agents love them because they buy crap, well, they buy property in crap areas that the locals won't buy. They overpay for it because they compare prices to where they live, which might be Sydney, Melbourne or Queensland. Um, and they're selling their clients down the river. So you really need to be careful in WA. Uh, and I would recommend use the established local buyers agents who've been operating in Perth for a really long time. There are definitely opportunities in Perth, but use the local agents. Don't work with these people who do this borderless buying because for them it's about fast, easy money at the expense of burning their client. Yeah, I like to endorse those comments. I think there's just far too many people out there who seem to have got the idea that um, a really, really easy way to make lots and lots of money is to call yourself a buyer's agent and then maybe put in five or six hours a week. Um, that's been taught in some quarters. It doesn't work like that. And this, um, the, the market seems to be awash with people uh, like that. Mm. You know, it's very important that you um, engage a buyer's agent that has uh, genuine expertise, experience and track record. A yeah, long-standing track record, absolutely. Um, so what I would like to everyone is offer access to the free resources. So if you go on to our Property Mavens website, which is propertymavens.com.au, you can see on the right-hand corner there's a little hamburger menu there. Just drop that down. You can request a free consultation. We're happy to provide that um, for people who'd like some help. Uh, under the free resources tab, you'll find my book, Property Prosperity. You can buy that as a hard copy or, or a digital version with Amazon. Um, there are common guides that we're happy to make available to you as well. Uh, then under the blog, there's plenty of um, uh, blogs that you can have a read, including these fake buyer agents or these imposter buyer agents that we were just talking about. You know, the sad thing about these people is they've been led to believe they can come in and not serve an apprenticeship in the industry and make fast, easy money for nothing. Uh, they're reckless. They're dangerous to consumers. They're getting sued. Hence my work as a uh, an expert witness, but yeah, they'll they ruin people's lives. Um, and sometimes they have the cheek and audacity to charge the same sort of fee as me. And you know they've got a great sales spiel, but if you dig under the surface and ask some technical questions about things they should know as an experienced agent or advocate, they'll pretty soon come unstuck. Um, and that'll just identify that what they say and what they know are two different things. So feel free to dig deep with people like that because they are risk to consumers. Certainly, uh, Property Mavens, uh, we are the only advocacy firm that has franchised our model nationally. We are recruiting. So if anyone on the call is a, an experienced advocate or real estate agent with a minimum of two years experience, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, we are growing the team and, yeah, there's a really great opportunity for people. So, you know, you might be able to add your photo to the list. And certainly if anyone um, would like to reach out directly and, as I said, log on log on to the website and download those free resources or follow us on our socials, all the information is there. Okay, thanks, Miriam. And I do urge people to, to follow up and make contact. Um, there's no cost in having the initial conversation um, to talk about your situation and um, to find out how property maidens might be able to help you um, buy the right property and grow a property portfolio. Keeping in mind that uh, so few people actually achieve that, Miriam. As you mentioned, most people have only one or two properties. And I think the reasons for that, people who go about it the right way, take on board expert advice, um, have a strategy um, based on sound principles and implement it with the, the assistance of qualified experts do achieve a portfolio and much greater success. Yeah. And look, right now, Terry, we are working with people who are looking for Airbnb properties where they can have partial use themselves and then let it out the rest of the time. And you have to be careful what you buy. I mean, we work with experienced um, short-stay property managers um, that we can refer people to. And you've got to have a really clear understanding. You can't just buy an apartment anywhere and think it's going to make a great short stay. There are things you have to be wary of. So, again, those risks are high, so be careful. All right, time to wrap it up. We're just coming up for the hour. Thank you again, Miriam. It's always 
great to do these webinars with you. Always lots of fantastic information and analysis based on how many years experience did you mention at the beginning? 27. 27. Yeah, I think it's so, so important for people um, when engaging experts to um, get on your team, people who have that kind of experience and expertise um, as evidenced by the number of awards that Property Maven have won over the years, including recently. Um, so let's do it again soon. Um, thanks again uh, for doing a great presentation and presenting our audience with uh, so much good information that um, is news you can use. And I do urge people to follow up and make contact with Miriam or some member of the team um, using the details you can see on the screen. So we'll do it again in a few more months. Bye for now. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye.